trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and its get someday for a This is the time that we set aside to take of the Lord's Supper. If you were unable to do so, if you need the supplies, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will get you some. At this time, we are set aside to remember Jesus' death on the cross, that great sacrifice for us. And we want to be careful uh, not to, to take this time lightly, not to just do it as something that, um, you know, something that we do just to get it done with or to get it over with. We want to make sure we reflect upon our lives, uh, to think about Jesus on the cross for us. He was the, the perfect sacrifice. We see that the, the people in Corinth, they kind of had problems with taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, so the book of 1 Corinthians, they're, they're reminded of how they're supposed to partake of it. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Starting verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless... Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. He was reminding them that this, this is something that unites us. As I spoke of this morning, it's, it's a reminder to help us to remember. It gives us something every week uh, to remind us of Jesus' sacrifice, a time that we can think upon that. If you would, please bow with me as I read the prayer for the bread. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time that we can use as a reminder to remember Jesus' death, sacrifice on the cross for us. As we partake of this bread, help us to think of his body, which was broken for us. Lord, help us to examine our lives, to partake in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please bow with me as a prayer for the cup? Lord, as we continue this, this Lord's Supper, we prepare to partake of the cup, the fruit of the vine. Help us to remember that it represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. It's through contact with that blood that innocent blood that was shed, that we can have a hope of being cleansed, of having eternal life. Lord, at this time, help us to, to look back and to reflect on that. We ask you help us to, to 
do so in a worthy manner. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time has been uh, found a convenient time to have a prayer for our offering. Uh, Since we haven't been passing the the plates anymore, there are some trays in the back so that you can can drop your offering in there at your convenience. Would Would you please pray with me? Dear Lord, at this time, we ask that you help us we give back a portion of the things we have to be used for your work. We ask that you help us to be be cheerful givers, be generous. We pray that the things that are collected are used to further your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that we do have. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to mark the invitation song, it'll be 587. That'll be the invitation song after the lesson. The song before the lesson will be 864. 864 will be the song before the lesson. If convenient for you, shall we stand to sing this song? <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? Me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Be seated, please. It's been a wonderful weekend, and I have... uh, Thoroughly enjoyed having the Warrenses here, and I'm so grateful that the Johnsons were here to, to be able to uh, entertain them last night. And we've got other great preachers in the house tonight. We've got Jimmy Pitchford here from Ennis, Texas. He'll be filling in out at the Oak Grove Church tonight, and he's going to stay with us until he has to skedaddle on out there. 
and we're so glad that you're here. We appreciate all the good work and the, uh, the work that you do in the Brotherhood, but he has a calling ministry. He'll call members of the church and gospel preachers all the time and just check and see how they're doing, and um, <clears throat> I just want to commend you for your good work. And then we've got Russ and Debbie Mullins here, and uh, they used to be in Cahoma for the longest time. I still can't get you out of Cahoma in my head. I know you're not there anymore, but um, anyway, we're so glad that you're here with us, and and thank you for all of the help that you're giving Sandy and Madison to help keep Phil straightened out. And, you know, I we'll probably have an intervention or a prayer before we see you off this week. Uh, looking forward to uh, the wonderful uh, time we're going to have tomorrow night at the Bible Bowl. Which You've got that thing coming on, don't you? Thank you so much. Appreciate that very much. All right. What makes a nation great is the question that we began to answer last Sunday morning. And we're going to recap just a little bit of that, and then we're going to continue to answer the question tonight. Let me help you understand that uh, what makes America great, and we've been talking about American greatness. This is not just about America. This is about all nations. Um, but here it is. Since we're thinking about America, what makes us so great is not anything, and though impressive it is, it's not about our landmass and our property. We've got a lot of it. Uh, it. It's not what makes us great. We've got billions and billions of dollars in natural resources, uh, great military power, uh, wonderful gross national product. Uh, 2018, it topped out at $21 billion, a little bit more than that. And uh, I don't know what it is today. I, it'll be interesting to see how, what it is when we get recovered from this um, uh, COVID-19 thing and see how that, it seems like it's going really nicely right now. Uh, what about the rich history? It's great, but it's not what makes us great. Our leadership over the years, well, there's been some really good ones, maybe not so good ones, and some corrupt ones, but we've had some good ones. But by and large, we've had good leadership over the years. And, uh, but that's not what makes us great. And uh, our founding documents are great, but that's not what makes us great. Um, innovative industry. Well, we've got some, if you think about all the things that have been invented right here in America, uh, wow, we've had some really ingenious people over the years, but that's not really what makes us great. Of course, our population is always increasing, but that's not what makes us great. What makes us great is what makes any nation great, and that is righteousness. Righteousness is said in Proverbs 14, 34, to exalt a nation, but sin, sin, which is the transgression of God's law, sin is a reproach to any people. Over in Daniel, the second chapter, verse number 21, we find out a portion of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and God is revealing to him in that dream that God makes the changes to the times and the seasons, that He removes kings and He raises up kings. That's something that old Nebuchadnezzar needs to understand. And later on, he does confess in verse number 37 of chapter 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice and, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. How does he know that? Because he walked in pride and God was able to bring him down. He was abased. He was humbled. Second principle, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33 and verse number 2. It was Patrick Henry that said it cannot be emphasized too strongly or, or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians, not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what helped formulate this great nation. And that cannot be overlooked. I realize that, that we're not talking about Christians in the sense of New Testament Christians. There's too broad a term in that. There's a denominationalized term uh, that is used for convenience sake. But I want you to understand that, that if righteousness is going to exalt a nation, if you're going to have a great nation, it's got to be founded upon and agreed upon to live by the standard of God's Word. Those folks that came over to Plymouth Rock, they insisted, no king but King Jesus. And isn't that what we're saying as New Testament Christians today? Basically, we're saying the same thing. Yes, we live under a government, but really, our king is the king of kings. That's who's, uh, who's our boss. And that's 
what we need to do when we go into any country. We need to let King Jesus be our boss. Benjamin Franklin said when they started writing the Constitution, he says, I beg that prayers henceforth that be made imploring the assistance of heaven. What they were doing in writing the Constitution was too big a deal not to invoke the wisdom of God Almighty. And when you think about our founding fathers, and I know there's all kinds of views that they had, but they were relying upon the wisdom. They all collectively agreed at the end of the day that in forming the Constitution, they needed to have uh, the wisdom of God on their side. And so they began the assembly, and before they took care of any business, they began to pray. And I think of that wonderful hymn in our hymn book. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? Probably one of the best things that we could ever do in our life. Johnny Ramsey always said that uh, we will go to our grave never having received all the blessings that we could have from the Lord simply because we didn't pray enough. And not that uh, we couldn't uh, consider ourselves to be prayerful people now, but we could always pray more. Wouldn't you agree to that? And here we are taking on the, the business of leading uh, the church or leading the country or leading our homes. One of the best things that we could do to start our day in whatever our endeavors are would be to start our day in prayer. And so if Benjamin Franklin could understand that, surely we as New Testament Christians should understand and agree to that. Number three, God is, in fact, the author of liberty and law. And in Psalm 22 and verse number 8, for the kingdom is the Lord's and He rules over the nations. Uh, that is a wonderful principle. That it was true of Israel. Israel's law was God's law. Now, that's not true of all of the nations. And, and I understand that, but you have to understand that, that if we are going to be a nation that glorifies God, a nation that God approves of, that our laws are going to have to reflect His laws. In other words, we've got some laws, we've got some things that we're promoting and allowing in this country uh, that, uh, that do not glorify God, that God does not approve of. Abortion is one of those things. Anytime you're talking about the taking of a life out of inconvenience or for convenience sake, you're talking about robbing someone of their life. It's only, and, and you follow this, and it's sort of like if, it, if, it's, uh, if the baby is wanted, then anybody who happens to kill that baby, well, that's murder. If anybody uh, kills a mother and kills the baby, that's considered murder. But if mama doesn't want the baby in our country and the mama takes the life, well then, that's not murder. Based on what mama wants, that's all it is. That's the standard. Whether she wants it or not, that's what constitutes the, uh, whether or not it's murder. I say that's sinful. And we ought to be ashamed of ourselves for such a thing. And yet you'll never convince the most liberal minds that that's not just a woman's right, a God-given right. That she can do what she wants to with her body. That's not true. Just because you have a body doesn't mean that you can do what you want to with it. I mean, you think about that sexually speaking. Paul said that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we have received from God, and ye are not your own. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is God's. You are God's. You belong to Him. So just because that we live in a culture that says if it feels good, do it, and if you want to play into that sexual revolt, then uh, you can just do anything you want to, have sex with anybody, however you want to do it. No. No, the Bible has restrictions on that. And we live in a very liberal, permissive, and promiscuous culture. And in those areas, I can tell you that we are not glorifying God. God will let us suffer for that kind of mentality as a nation. Psalm 67 and verse number 4 Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously, and notice the last part of this, and govern the nations on earth. Notice that this psalm, though it was directed, it was a song in the songbook of the Hebrews, and yet it teaches that God rules in the kingdoms of men, that He governs the nations on earth, and that's the point that I want you to see tonight. 
And what God was trying to teach His people in the Old Testament through Moses, and Moses does it right here in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. He wants the law of God to be taught to the people of God, not just in a public way, but in homes. In other words, mama and daddy teaching the Word of God to their children in the home. You know, we place a lot of emphasis on, on Bible classes. And I think we should. I think that we ought to be in Bible class all the time. I think we need to get up bright and early. In fact, I think we need to get to bed at a decent time on Saturday night so we can get up at a decent time on Sunday morning and treat Sunday mornings as more important than Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and Friday. And we need to place a premium on that, and we need to show our kids that we're placing a premium on Bible education and as parents that we restore the idea of getting our kids up here in time, having them a nice good breakfast, and getting them up here on time to be in their Bible classes because we have folks that have prepared a Bible class and, and they need to be taught the Word of God. But that's not where all the work is done. Just because I'm promoting the work of the church doesn't mean that, that, that that's all there is to it. I believe that you need to be teaching the Bible in your homes. You need to be using every opportunity. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and following tells us to teach. If we're going to take a lesson from the Old Testament, teach the Word of God when we get up and when we bed down. When we're walking by the way, whenever there's a moment, it is a teachable moment to bring God up. Our kids, I think about it, they spend an eight hours a day at school, and we've got a lot of times the public school system and everything else that we've got going on in these kids' lives um, that's vying for their attention and their brain power and their energy, and we spend very little time, comparatively speaking, teaching at home. I believe we need to be the most influential teacher. And one of the things I can ask you as parents to consider doing is before you drop your kid off at school, maybe you homeschool. Well, you could get your day started with prayer, but if you're taking them to the public school, start your day off with prayer. Now, our, co our custom in the Grota family is the boys. I take them to Hart's Bluff, and, and Caden catches the bus to Chapel Hill from there. But, but you know what? Um, most mornings, we will start that prayer, all right? And here lately, it's whoever rides shotgun. But they're not flip-flops, so I have to, I have to, uh, to tell them who's going to do the prayer. But uh, we forgot Friday. I don't know, somehow we got to driving down the road, and we were at the school before we know it, and I drove off, and I said, man, I forgot, we forgot to do our prayer this morning. Kick myself in the pants for just forgetting to say a prayer on the way to school that morning. You know what? When you can get to feeling guilty for not saying a prayer, that's pretty good, I think. What about it, guys? Can we do that? Can we start our children's day off with prayer? I believe we could do that, and we can teach the Word of God. We can use those teachable moments all the day. And so God has the home, the church, and the government. I don't know that He invented the government, but He allowed the government to be invented, and, and it's a tool that He uses. And I know this, that there have been times past in our history that, that the home was stronger than what it was, and the church may have been stronger than... Well, I hope it's, it's as strong here as it ever was anywhere else. But, but, you know, there may be a little more leniency towards uh, sinful things. Maybe the, the way we approach it is not so uh, stern. Maybe we're kinder and gentler in, in this culture to a fault that we don't bring up in conversations sin issues like we once did in the church. But I know that we have a very permissive government. And so you think about divorce for just a minute. What's keeping our families together? What's going to keep our homes together? Where are the pressures from the government? They're not existent. And where are the pressures from the society, from our jobs? They're not existent. Where's the pressures from our families? If we don't get it from the church, where are we going to get it? And so we need to think about these things. God sets up kings and He removes kings, the Bible tells us. Winston Churchill said, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you're likely to see. I think it's interesting. We need to be able to look to the, to the past to see the future. A lot of folks don't want to do that. They don't want to take the lessons learned from the past, but there are so many valuable lessons. You can look at patterns in the past and learn about the future. George Santayana said that, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You know, you, we've always heard that and we've echoed it. We didn't know it was George who said it, but he was. And, and, and this is the point. We need to 
remember that the Bible teaches us the very same thing. You know, historians can tell us what happened in newspapers and internet can, and news can tell us what's happening now. But really, the Bible is the only thing that can tell us why anything is happening. And in the Old Testament, God explained to Israel how to remain a nation. In Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 through 23, God says, You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I'm bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. How about that? Because they were coming from Egypt, they were going to the land of Canaan, but that was occupied by a bunch of foreigners that God was going to have them to fight against. And he was going to cause them to lose those battles and die. That was God. God was using the Israelite nation by giving them the promised land was actually a judgment against all the inhabitants of the land that was there at that time. Think about that for a minute. But he says, the land will proverbially or figuratively speaking will vomit you out. You won't be able to enjoy what God is going to give you if you don't remain faithful to me. And verse number 23, he says, And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you. Don't adopt their rules. Don't adopt their laws. Don't look at their behaviors and think that's wisdom. He says, it's what they're doing, it's the way they're behaving that's making me so upset, and I'm going to bring judgment on, on, on them. He says, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. Whatever it is that causes God to feel that way, we need to take a lesson from it and say, let's not do that. But the problem here is, is that you can say in America today that you're a person of faith, and, and yet we find that people want to compartmentalize that faith and do what they want to politically. And that's sinful. And God's not going to let that go by without judgment. Sir John Glubb, in his writing The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival, he was an honored British general and historian. He said that there were seven stages uh, through which an empire passes. There is, first of all, the age of outburst, that is, explorers, pioneers, their heroes, the age of the discovery. And then there's the age of conquests. Soldiers would, of course, become the heroes. Then there's the age of commerce, entrepreneurship. They become the heroes. The age of affluence. That makes the rich people the heroes. And, and the empire switches from offense to defense. It stops taking territory and starts building walls. And then there's the age of, of intellect, where in, intellectuals are the heroes. Just like where we are in America today. Its educational institutions often produce the skeptics who oppose the values and religious beliefs of early leaders. Sounds somewhat familiar to me. And then there's the age of decadence, which this also kind of sounds like today, where the entertainers are the heroes, Hollywood. <clears throat> and then, of course, then the age of decline and collapse. And, of course, <laughs> there's no heroes there. Everybody and everything is the hero, except for righteousness. God. Have you ever wondered during the COVID-19 experience, we've never experienced something like this. Uh, you, you know, there's always been sicknesses and plagues, but our, our response as a nation to it is um, unprecedented, and not all of it for the good. What's been impressive to me is what 
the governments across the nation have considered to be essential businesses. Why is it that bars in some places were more essential? Or I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, bars are really the ones that are fighting to stay open. It's the uh, liquor stores that were considered essential businesses. Why were bars in some states essential businesses but not churches? Think about that for a minute. And I'm glad that we live in Texas where the churches are protected, but not in California, the left coast, I mean the west coast. Think about it. Why they're up in arms over there. And you've got people, instead of voting those yokers out of office and saying, hey, we're going to take our state back, they're leaving New York, they're leaving uh, California in droves. We've got people living on our street right now from Oregon and from Washington State and from California. One family all moving to Texas, moving out here. Living in a rent house just down the road. They can't stand it anymore, can't take it anymore. They're ready to leave. And they've left. And they're starting all over right here. Edward Gibbon and his decline of and fall of the Roman Empire. There's a lot of reading in that. And most people learn from his writings through cliff notes or some other abbreviated thing, but he says that the decline of the Roman Empire, he gave five reasons for it. Number one was the rapid increase in divorce, which undermined the sanctity of the home and the basis of society. Isn't this one of the, one of the problems, and I've heard some of the people in the Republican and the Democratic Party both speak to this, uh, the father less homes, uh, the absentee fathers in this country. Why are we not attacking the problem by preaching the gospel? There's no way to turn this problem around unless God's Word gets into the heart of the men of this country and the, and the families have got to stop living together before marriage. Don't do that. That is getting the cart before the horse. We should not do that. That's a sin to be repented of. And, and this idea of cohabitation, not being married, everybody's doing it. And for some, it's because they fear divorce. But for others, it's, they anticipate divorce. It's like getting married with a prenuptial agreement. Why would you want to do that? It's like saying, hey, let's get married and love each other without trust. Why would you do that? And that's our culture. The high divorce rate. The high taxes to provide bread and entertainment in the city of Rome, about half of its non-slave population, 1.2 million people in AD 170, was, was really on the dole of Rome. Government provided food, corn, bread, oil, wine, and pork, and kept senators in good standing, and government provided circuses, kept the masses content. It was not the government's job to do that, but they had assumed the role of keeping every, trying to keep everybody happy, and to, to be able to afford that, they had to tax people. The taxes just keep going up and up and up and up. And I remember when we took another step towards socialized medicine with Obamacare, and why I believe I make a pretty good salary, I made too much to qualify for Obamacare subsidies, government subsidies, $13,500 the first year we looked into the marketplace. And I don't make that kind of money. Why? How do you afford to give? How can you give a good quality health care? Well, you can give a not so good quality of health care, and they will give you the terms and conditions of your treatments and your doctors and things of that nature. But in this country, we have not traditionally deemed that it was the government's job to provide health care. And if they provide health care, then how many areas in our life do we want to let the government run? Now, a corrupt government will not do a very good job with this. 
High taxes were part of the problem for Rome. A mad craze for pleasure and brutality. You know, they had gladiators fighting to the death, and they fed Christians to hungry lions and burned Christians as human wicks for candles to light the stadiums and the streetways, and you've read about that. When barbaric actions become okay with us, that's a problem in a country. And then, of course, the building of gigantic armaments and the real enemy was actually within. They had lost control of their borders, and building the walls were not going to actually do anything. While the empire's capital had 13 miles of 40 feet walls, large numbers of foreign immigrants settled inside those walls that had a very different view of how to do life. And then, of course, the decay of religion, faith, for what it was for Rome, faded into a mere form and losing touch with actual life. And my, um, my, my, my concern is, is that in this country that Christianity is becoming that. It, it's becoming the entertainment industry. It was using entertainment to keep people involved and and, and, of course, um, with that, there is the compartmentalization of, of, uh, of religion. And, and so when you compartmentalize it, you have no use for it outside the church walls. That is a problem. And of course, you can read about the problems in Romans chapter 1, and I'll briefly review these things. But when you look to Romans chapter 1, you can see some of the problems in uh, the, the, and the ignorance that was there, the first stage of society's decline, was ignorance. Verses 18 through verse number 22, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And for since the creation of the world, the invisible, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Which led to idolatry in verse number 23. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four footed animals, and to creeping things. Which, of course, led to indulgence in verse number 22, 24 through 27. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. He is describing, in fact, what we call homosexuality, the same-sex relationship. What is so popularized this day and time has only been popular for just a little while. And I think because of our view in this country of trying to make everybody feel comfortable in their sinful choices. I can remember a day where... I remember what the rainbow flag come to represent. I always thought the rainbow was a godly symbol. But then it had been adopted as a gay pride um, symbol. Having grown up in that environment, I began to understand a little bit about what was at play. But in a national way, there was nothing being celebrated 
to the extent that it is today. It certainly wasn't the uh, inundation of that type of behavior on television shows, which I think reinforce those concepts in our young people. And our young people will say, well, I know the Word of God says that, but the rest of the culture in which I'm growing up in says it's okay. Which shall you choose? Well, that's where the parenting comes in, and that is where our young people have to make a choice. Do they believe in God? Will they choose what God says? And what are some of the problems? You know, YouTube is filled with videos of former homosexuals. Now, I say that for the good because what they're doing is they're saying how they came out of that practice. How is it that they were taught the truth and how is it that they were ministered to? How is it that they came to change that way of life? Let me tell you that there is no difference between adultery and uh, unmarried sex, which is fornication, versus any other sexual deviancy. It is all a choice at the end of the day. I think that those choices are influenced by environment. They've been influenced by other sinful activities like rape and ancestral relationships, molestation, and the like, and have brought about a great deal of confusion for the victims. But this indulgence that we read about in verse 27 gives way to impenitence in verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And let me tell you something about that. When people become so comfortable in their sin, it is very difficult to retain God in their knowledge. Why? Because unfaithful children of God are the most miserable people on earth. They're miserable because their conscience is constantly being pricked by the Word of God. And it would be far more comfortable to disassociate themselves from that relationship. And when you don't like to retain God in your knowledge, you can do in a good conscience what God does not approve of. And God is saying in verse number 28 that Paul is saying that God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, and they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, but not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is the people who say, I don't want to retain God in my knowledge. But I need other like-minded people to make me feel justified in my behavior. So I'm going to find other people to, uh, to convert to my way of thinking. I will seduce them. I will taunt, I will not taunt, I will tempt and I will entice other of my acquaintances to uh, participate in my deviancy. And I will cause them to abandon God's Word too. Now, I know what God's Word says. The Bible says that a judgment awaits my bad behavior. But I don't care because I have my present company. I have my friends. I have my people that will help me feel justified in what I'm doing wrong. And you see, that is the point that I'm trying to make is that, that sinful behavior loves the justification of other sinful people. We learn, though, however, that God punishes nations. German 
philosopher Hegel said, what experience and history teaches, teach us is this. And we're looking at experience and history, and he says that people and governments never have learned anything from history. It's only a few people that actually act on the principles that we learn from history. Only the wise, and sometimes the wise are outnumbered by the foolish. Why does America, for instance, want to buy into socialism? And I don't say everybody does, but I say that, that they're doing a pretty good job popularizing socialism and Marxist theology, Marxist ideology rather, states that, that before you can have a Marxist government, that you must first have a socialist government. It's a stepping stone to that end. Why can't we take a good hard look at all of the Marxist and socialist countries in the world and see how it's working for them or how it had worked in the past? Is it because we're too busy with our own lives and our own interests and we think that everything is going to be as it always is and always was? and That nothing major is going to change? Friends, we have one of the biggest problems in our history, that is sex trafficking, human trafficking. It's a real deal, and you need to watch your social media parents of your kids. It's a window into your home. The bumper stickers that you put on your car tell predators what your children are involved in, where they go to school, what are their after-school activities, how many children you have. Sometimes it has their names. We live in a very, very dangerous time. And to fearmonger is obviously not popular. We don't want to cause fear, but law enforcement agencies are constantly going to school learning how to spot sex trafficking when they see it. Interdiction classes all the time. I've got a book from three years ago where I went down to the Civic Center and sat in on one of those classes. And it would shock you. And maybe some of you it would shock. Maybe others of you are very keenly aware of the problem we have going on. But do you not believe for a minute that one of the reasons why sex trafficking, you've got to have somebody to sell the children. You've got to have somebody to kidnap the children, sell the children, and you've got to have somebody to buy the children. And my, my point is simply this. If we didn't have a hyper-sexualized society, then maybe that problem wouldn't be so acute. But it is because we live in an overly sexualized society. Sex sells everything. And We've dropped cable 10 years ago because we didn't want our children to watch things on television uh, that we could not govern and filter. And that seems to be the root of Romans chapter 1's problem. All of these, whether we're looking at Romans chapter 1, if we're looking at Mr. Glubb's um, ideas of... of the fate of empires in the search for survival, or whether we're talking about Gibbon's decline of the fallen Roman Empire, whatever it is that we're studying, we're looking at a society that has left the principles, the basic principles of godliness, and have no limits, no lines in their own hearts that cannot be crossed. Jeremiah says of Israel, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant, 
He says, if that nation whom I have spoken against turns from his evil, it's kind of like, kind of like Jonah going into uh, to Nineveh. But if our country is A-OK, then we don't have anything to worry about. But if we have a very spiritual problem in our country today, government cannot solve the problem because it doesn't know the answers. Only Jesus Christ can. And that would make the church a very important agent in the restoration of our country. If any time we ever needed to preach the gospel, it's now. Where sin is gone, must go its grace. The gospel is for all. But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. The opposite is true. The lesson is yours. Sin is a reproach to any people. It's the chief problem that we've got right now, and it's what we're arguing over and trying to fix politically. But it will not be sufficient political. It has to be done from the gospel. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, we'd love to sit down in a Bible study and talk to you. You could let us know at the back of the auditorium. Maybe you'd like to come forward and tell us that you'd like to have a study. Maybe you have studied and you know what you need to do to be saved. And tonight's the night you'd like to put on Christ in baptism. Maybe it is you need the prayers of the church. We invite you to come forward right now in response to this gospel sermon tonight while we stand and while we sing.